There's no A5 there. I've never understood the timing of that bit. I had it somewhere recorded I could play it. <laughs> Timing. Have I got a cap? Oh, I have a cap. Cap, I have got a cap. I get, I get done every time I play something by this particular band. Oof, blimey. No, I need my shove capo. This is no good. I can't do that. I can't play it on the open thing on the G. Favorite what I was doing before. Uh, uh, they got no written the chords there, damn it. No good.
Um, this is EJ200. And it's a, it's a big old thing and it has projection, sound projection to accompany it. A big old thingness about it. Um, it's quite a beast. Uh, I really enjoyed playing it the other night. Um, quite easy to play as well. What have we got here really? We've got a lovely great big, is it a dreadnought? Do they call it that? I think they do. A big, 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 big guitar. It's got a lot of projection to it. Sounds great. Um, and Steve sent it down to me, um, wondering if there's any improvement I can make on the action. Just having a look here, there's a kind of tiny gap I can see, but it's nothing. It's just a, it's cosmetic. Um, so it's not anything lifting off. I just spotted it, so I just wanted to check. Um, yeah, so I've had a look at this. Well, first of all, what do we know about it? Well, apart from being a lovely big guitar and playing very nicely, um, I can, if we zoom in a bit, I can, ooh, we're not even in the zoom in department, are we? If we zoom in a bit, um, we can see we've got the big old Epiphone headpiece thing there. We've got a plastic nut. In true Epiphone style, which I'm going to replace with a tusk for that purpose. Um, the, the strings are a little bit worn now, but they still sound fairly good. But we'll replace them with the same same gauge, 1152 phosphor bronzes. Uh, there may be a sorry, I'm not even looking at what I'm putting the camera at. There may be a tiny bit of wear on the frets, um, and I'll look at my notes in a minute to see whether Steve wants any fret work done on it at all. And what we have down here is we've got quite a low um, a low saddle already and a fairly uh, limited amount of brake angle on this um, high E over here. 
and what we've got is we've got 2.2 millimeters sorry we've got 2.2 millimeters at the last fret here and 1.5 over on the e side of things actually really for an acoustic guitar maybe we can make a slight adjustment on the bass side but really there's not a lot more to take out um 1.5 is about as low as i would go on an acoustic guitar on the top end um two two just under two down to 1.5 so there's a very small amount we can do um but we could also go the whole hog and do a little bit of careful fret leveling to get rid of the Oh, I'm sorry, you're still looking in the wrong place up there. My mistake. Get rid of the um, the fret wear. So I'm going to have a, a little look and see whether um, what else we know about it. Let's zoom you out into big panoramic mode, outward looking mode. There we are. Um, you need a wide angle for this camera. Camera? Guitar. Um, yeah, so not a lot of room there. This is a bone nut by the looks of it. Bone nut and a plastic saddle. Uh, sorry, bone saddle, plastic nut which is an odd combination, so maybe it's been changed in the past. Um, as it happens, the first fret action is fairly good. A tiny little inconsistency here and there, but it's pretty low, so it makes it quite nice to play. Um, so we, we need to kind of aim for the same, if not, you know, a little, possibly about, well, nearly just about the same, possibly a little bit higher on the B because um, that seems to me almost too low, but we shall see. Now, I looked at the relief in this, and there's very little relief. It's very flat neck. Um, it's a very flat neck. For an acoustic guitar, that's barely any. Um, what I'm also interested about uh, is the shape of the neck at this point. And I, to me, kind of my, my eyeball says it's bending down towards the body, but actually... It, I don't think it is. It's probably not helped by this being worn a little at the end here, deliberately smoothed off so you don't catch your fingers on it. Um, so yeah, we think we want to remove the nut here. Um, plastic nut. Now, being Epiphones, up till now, these have seemed to have been cut the correct way and fitted the right way. So we should be able to assume that we can get that off without having to destroy the nut in, in the process. Um, regarding the action down this end, well, um, you know, I think we'll we'll go on the basis. We'll take a tiny bit off the the uh, bass side. slap happening around here So yeah, very small improvement. Um, we can probably do a little bit of leveling, careful leveling to um, clean up, well two things, to clean up that tiny bit of fret slap that I'm hearing, but also to um, remove the, at the same time as a bonus, remove the um, fret wear grooves down there. So I'm just gonna start by um, slacking this off. I think we'll probably be best off switching the nut out first. Um, now, you know, plastic isn't the worst material in the world. Um, you know, a nut is a nut. You know, you can do, you can play all year long with that. Um, and the truth is that you're not bending the strings anywhere near as hard as you would with a an electric guitar so the kind of necessity of the tusk is not as high um, you could enjoy that guitar forever with the plastic nut on there but I like to think that we'll improve the tuning stability just a little bit more now again I don't want to have to cut this nut in half to get it off it should 
Judging by Ep Epiphone's track record, it should be cooperative and come off quite easily. So I'm going to give it a little tap and a, I say easily, it's probably been glued on quite well. You hear that little cracking noise as it comes loose. Um, that breaks the glue seal. I'm just having a look where it goes after that. So we've got a little line here from where the that's where the that thing goes, the cover. So so I just want to try and figure out where this is holding on. Um, I think there's a little bit holding on at the front. So this may actually be a different manufacturing process. So it's going to let me down a little bit, but we should be able to ease this off at the front edge. Um, you know, I've said this on a number of different uh, setups that people kind of recommend that you, you know, you get your knife in here and you run the knife down the front of this crack. Now you hear that cracking noise. That's the sound of the knife <laughs> upsetting the um, the finish. All right, there's no really easy way to get that off. It's, it's now come off all right, but if it was if it was happened to be stuck glued in by that finish, there wasn't a lot I could do about it that would be coming out of its own free will. Okay, so this is listed as a well. Uh, this is this is this nut is ordered based on its string spacing and its closeness to the width. So it is a little bit oversized, but it's the perfect spacing, which is the key thing. So I can file down or sand down on either side. Okay. Get out of there. Right. So width-wise, that seems to be may still be just a tiny fraction too wide. So what I'm going to do is get this going first. We'll move this out of the way and we'll do the sanding part first. Now this is an old bit of sand paper but it should still work. I'm going to do a little bit of flatting on the surface uh, just to thin it down a little bit. These tusk nuts in reality they're quite uneven on the front edges. Um, they have sort of little concave sections so to get them completely flat they do actually benefit from a little bit of sanding and you can, I don't know if you can see but there's a light spot where it's still sunken comparatively right, that's all now flat and I just want it to sit perfectly comfortably on that shelf and we just I might take a bit more it um, has to sit there is a tiny lip where the finish ends sorry or starts I should say so we have to try and make sure that this just sits inside of that and what we'll find is if we measure its width down the bottom here in mils would help we've got probably just under six and this is now just under six so that should be a nice fit okay so width wise um, we've got 42.5 and here we've got 43.5 so we need to lose a millimeter from the width and I'm going to do it with this little end sanding Thing here, which I can use in one of two different ways. What are we aiming for? We're aiming for 42.7. So I've done a bit off the base side, do some off the treble side. Mind, I can't remember things. 42.6. 42.6. 42 42.6. A bit more to go. Forty-two point 
Let's do a little bit more. So once we get this the right um, width, then we have to get it down to the right height. Now just looking at this, they're probably very close to begin with, so it shouldn't be too big a problem. Um, but we want to get it as accurately as possible. So that's again quite a sensitive or delicate task. Um, and that again only really there's only one way to do it and that's careful work with the um, with the sandpaper. So I'm just working my way very carefully to the width. Um, the reason for that is it's, it's incredibly easy to overdo it and end up with it looking a bit short and feeling a bit odd. So it's better to just sort of approach the correct size bit by bit and, and you can put it on and you'll feel the sort of the flush or the overhang. So while it's still overhanging we'll take a bit more. So this is riveting te television I know, video. Had um had one of those strange internet moments yesterday. Um, forgive me for kind of waxing lyrical for a minute. Um, and I'm going to recount it because I'm sure that most people have probably had an experience like this and recognise it. It's one of the weirdest things about the the internet age. So um, it goes like this. I was. On YouTube yesterday, looking for something light-hearted-ish to watch, and up came uh, a video feed of what was it? Oh, it, was a, it looked like a, a guy on a bike. I saw briefly um, motorcycle, um, which I used to ride a lot, and, uh, and then he I saw he ended up sitting by a cold lake somewhere, and then. The title of the video was Goodbye, or oh, sorry, R.I.P. Pia. And I don't know the person or who this Pia was, um, but it, you know, I started just watching it because it was kind of evident that he, he was saying goodbye to someone. Um, and so it turned out to be a, I think, a Danish guy, um, judging by his accent. Um, and he's telling, talking to camera, about the loss of this person and he didn't sort of go straight into it so I had to keep watching to learn more about what was going on and um, he sort of worked his way slowly up to he told he kind of he knew from the title that somebody was gone and he was talking about a woman he was had a special relationship with for some long time and then how they'd been doing a video channel together and then how they'd gone on a journey together and it ended up with them having an accident together on this journey and some of you may know who this channel is anyway I didn't I've never seen them before um, and so you know I was quite kind of captivated to you know it was, it was quite immediately sort of a terribly sad thing but kept me wanting to find out more so I watched some more and I went and watched the video that they were vlogging of their trip and I saw them go and have this accident together, both on individual bikes and they were somewhere in northern Norway, Arctic wastes of Norway and they were riding on a, a sort of trail road uh, path kind of thing and they um, somehow they rode off the road down into a river that, that cut the road directly in half. So the river flowed across the road, right angles, at the bottom of a gully. Um, and you couldn't see that from approaching it. So they had not expected it, quite understandably, and had just both ridden straight into this hole. And it was a, about a four foot drop into this river and they both ended up crashed at the bottom of this thing in the river. Anyway, so, you know, that was compelling sort of story anyway, so I was watching that and the peer, this, this 
girlfriend, Pia, sort of was also hurt, but not as badly, and she basically called in the rescue from her phone and got them eventually helicoptered out to a hospital where he had to have some serious operations and took a long time to recover. And she kind of, not only did she organise the rescue, she then sort of oversaw his recovery. Um, but it was quite shocking. You know, I've been a biker and I know what it's like to be involved in a serious crash like that. So it was, it was terrifying to watch them crash and then the after effects. And then to know that already I'm watching this and I'm thinking, but she's already gone. And it turns out she left him shortly after he'd recovered. She stayed around until he got better and then she she finished their relationship. And of course that was heartbreaking for him. Now this is going to be a little low. This is interesting. I may have to boost this nut. Um, anyway, yes, yeah, so to carry on. Um, yes, yeah, so she he had to deal with losing her as a partner and then... Um, a couple of months after she left him as his partner, she committed suicide. Um, so it's really awful to watch, to kind of meet somebody, inverted commas, online, and then for them to, for, the, for you to find out that then they're gone, um, and to see it all played out in sped up time. It's very, very weird. So, and I kind of watched her... Um, you know, and, and you, of course you find yourself looking at what kind of character she was in those videos as she's kind of checking in from the hospitals and reporting on his health and always, you know, always taking care of him because she was a nurse. Um, and maybe that's how their relationship was a bit. Um, maybe that's why it didn't work out. But anyway, um, so I kind of, yeah, look at that, see? Replacement nut not deep enough. It says it was for ep Epiphone as well, so that's a bit of a, a bit of a lie. So I'm going to have to boost this a little bit, um, which is fair enough. I get to do that many times on tusk nuts and other things. Anyway, yeah. So um, yeah, just oh, how, how strange to kind of experience something like that and and know that they're not there. And I I don't know if you've I've done that. A couple of times I've done that now, watching something, and then you find out. First time I think it was I was watching a glider pilot in um, in New Zealand, um, and I found yeah, I was learning to glide myself, and I found this um, I found this amazing woman who was a young woman who was doing these great things, and to learn that uh, she died, and I can't remember um, it was an illness, I think it was, but I kind of got all sort of excited watching this, watching her do her thing and then to um, kind of get fast forward it and discover people writing kind of condolence things and you go, why, why, why are you doing that? And you sort of have a horrible realisation that you sort of know why. Um, and it turns out that, yeah, she passed away. So it's a weird thing on the internet that you can sort of meet somebody be interested in you know finding out about them and then within the space of an, an hour of watching looking at their stuff and getting to know them a tiny bit they're gone which is it's quite a roller coaster it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel correct or right that it should be like that so of course I mean it must have been trebly worse triply worse triple badness for him to have lost his girlfriend. Now I've got some leftover tusk bits here. Um, I'm just looking to see whether I could use these to boost this up. Um, it doesn't even have to be tusk. It can be another material. It could. It can be a piece of white plastic or even a piece of bone because the bone. It's probably better to use a, a sizable piece of bone that I've got available and just work that down. Um, it'd be simpler. Uh, so let me find out a bit I can use that's flat and wide enough. In fact, that's probably a good start point. So now I get the glue, and we. This is this seems really crazy because we're going to add. Um, we're going to add the great big chunk of uh, bone to the bottom, and realistically, we're going to then sand back 
most of that away again so it doesn't remain. Seems a bit nuts, but okay, let's line this up somewhere. Get it reasonably flush. Well, not like that, because that isn't. Okay, that's two flat surfaces. And I've got some uh, I've got some accelerant over there, so I'm just going to put this under a little bit of pressure. Hopefully it will stay put, not, not sort of snap off. While I spray some accelerant on it. So it's going to be a bit of sanding down now. Now sometimes the accelerant you choose to use just doesn't really work with the thing you just maybe it does I don't know so okay so that's a uh, that's called boosting a tusk nut the fact that it's a little bit of bone at the bottom has no performance indicate impact at all it's just going to give us a, a sort of t two hundredths of a millimeter lift and that's all we need it for but it's going to be quite a bit of sanding and work to get it down and then I'm just going to have to sand you know size it up again like I would if I began with it at the right size um, it's a it's a funny thing because let's just move this a little bit there yeah it's a it's a funny thing because that is a fraction too low that shelf now to get this where I want it I'm going to need to um, partly sand it, but also uh, some of it I might need to file down to get the bulk of it out of the way. So it's a different material. I should probably go go for bulk first. Um, I'm going to do this on the spinny thing over there, so I'm going to leave my microphone here so you don't get deafened by the spinny sanding and block thing. I'm going to take as much as I can of the material out of the way. I've got some black tusk I could have used, but that's not really any good. Right, noises.
about that. It's just the way it is. Noisy and mucky. So that's taken down the bone quite a way um, and it's left me enough sticking out that I can sort of sand it down smooth uh, and get it to the right size and everything by hand. So, pretty good. And I can also sand down the overhang on the back here without cutting into the tusk, which we don't want to do. And then same on the front edge, which we can do off the edge here. Nearly there. Once I've got this down to a workable size um, and flush, then what I'll do is I will concentrate on coming down in height. So flush there. Nice, nice, nice. Okie dokie. Um, on this back edge here. So this is often what I end up having to do if you buy a nut and you, you're desperate for a tusk one and they don't have one um, exactly the right size. I, I was hoping this would be uh, true to its word and it would fit an Epiphone. It says Epiphone, but uh, my main priority was the string spacing because, as you know, I can I can send the thickness back and you know make adjustments and so on it was just the it was really the uh, string spacing that had to be right to begin with and that was so I was happy with that okay a little bit more on these edges through the glue bit. Almost there. You should pretty much spot on. Now the main thing right now will be uh, flattening and thinning the base down now. So I'm just going to round off these corners so they're not in mine or anyone else's way. And I'm going to use that thing again just to line up the bone with the rest of the material. It'll be, it'll be a tiny thickness when we're finished. It will be barely noticeable amount because we only need about a tenth of a millimeter if that. It's such a tiny amount but it's worth doing because I don't want to, I prefer not to put in a, you know, a loose shim. I'd rather use something solid um, that's attached so we start with adding a, a big chunk and then working that chunk down to a, a proper size so this paper feels a bit worn out so I'm going to change it for the other one so um, what's this one like oh that might be a good start point So at this point in time, I, can't, I mustn't go past the point and overdo it. I've got to be able to work it down under control. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark what I need for each of these to get it exactly right. So 7.8. 7 point, 7 point on the base side. 
7.8 on the base side and in the slot as close as we can get it 8.2 on the treble side. It's often the case that it appears to be taller but it's only taller because we can't get the um, get the blade of the caliper in there. So it's 9.78 and this is 9.2 so we've got to keep coming down 9.78 and 8.2 9.78 and 8.2 is that what it said 8.2? 7.8 9.2, 9 9.2. 9 so, 7.8, 9.2, 8.8 is 1.4, and the other one is 1. Point, probably 4 again, that's not bad. So it's even Stevens, 1.4 across both sides we need to remove. So we need a straight sanding, and we need to take the height down, the thickness down, but at the same time, I want to do it in a way that keeps a flat, perpendicular bottom uh, 90 degrees to the nut. And when I notice it kind of going one way or another, I need to just counteract the push, the lean a little bit, and bring it back. And I've got 1.4 millimeters to accommodate that change in lean if I have to. Um, I think I was about right. Nice and tall. So, uh, we're taking off 1.4, we're coming down, we're on 8.84 now, so we're one, we've done about 0.4 and we're one off. So I'll change sides again. So you can see it's a bit painstaking. Um, we can make it slow and repetitive, or we can press really hard, in which case that's where we run the risk of it changing its lean and we have to correct the angle a bit. So. Um, I'm trying to just aim to keep it the same on both sides. So it's a very tiny amount that's going to be left on here, but that's the way. So 8.7, 8.75, 8.8, 8.9, 8.10, 8.11, 8.12, 8.13, 8.14, 8.15, 8.16, 8.17, 8.18, 8.19, 8.20, 8.21, 8.22, 8.23, 8.24, 8.25, 
there's hardly any bone left on there at all. It's microscopic actually. 8.13, so close. And 8.8, .8, very close too. Right, let's switch to a finer paper. I think we were, I mean, we could, at this point, we could test it for, for fit. Um, and just have a quick visual on it. A little bit clumsy with the things still in the way, but. This has got this has got one of those cut-offs of offcuts of string that's spinning round and digging into the finish. We don't want that. Okay, that's actually very nice. Um, possibly a fraction too high still on the actually do you know what? That's nearly spot on. I don't think I want to go any lower. I think we're pra practically there. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to... I shouldn't have brought this. I didn't want this at all. I'm going to just level it out very, very carefully with the fine paper as much as I can. Which isn't going to be helped by this thing. I don't want that. I want this. And then I'm pretty much there. So if anything, the treble side is a tiny fraction high but it's so little that it makes almost no difference. I think we're everything's straight up and lovely and flat and I'm going to call it quits right there. So bring this back over here. Oh, what, I, what I'm going to do, since we are going to do a leveling on this, I'm going to, <coughs> I'm going to put, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I'm going to mark up the frets. I think I've got bone dust in my windpipe. Um, mark the frets up. So the purpose of the fret leveling is very, very light and only to um, alleviate the fret slap at the top here. Now, if you remember, I haven't done anything yet with the, the saddle. So the reason I'm just going to hold fire until I put this nut on, and then I'm going to, oh, it's on, uh, and then I'm going to look again at the that thing at the end there, sad little. But if, the, if I'm happy with where the nut is, I'm going to check again what the action is. I will just double check it anyway, um, and then we'll make a call on the amount taken off the saddle. <clears throat> which will be very little, and if you recall, it's going to be probably a little bit at the uh, uh, sorry, base end, not the treble end. These, these. That's why I hate those things. They not only stick in me; they go round and scrape in your finish. It's not a good thing to have those bits sticking out. <clears throat> okay. So we, at the other end, we said we were going from 2.2 currently to 1.5. Let me just double check that again. Yeah, to just over 2 to 1.5. So really, we've got a tiny bit to take off. Now this is really going to be, we're not even going to have a chance to put this back in and, t and sort of test it or mark it up. It's too small an amendment to even mark up. So I'm just going to do it by, uh, if we can remove this first of all, we'll measure this with the digital caliper and then we'll just take it down a tiny fraction with the caliper. So just a little bit of a 
Oh. Come on. Thank you. Again, <coughs> move this conveniently out the way. That's good. Nut is good. Okay, now we're going to measure this. And we said about 0.2 on this side. So we're going to take the measurement right from the end. We're going to go 606 on the base side. 606. That's another 606 from another day. And then on the treble side, we've got right at the end, we've got 4.24. 4.24. Um, I want it to be 5.8 on the base side and um, 4.0 on the treble side. So it's 2 millimeters <coughs> all the way across. Mm, sorry, not 2 millimeters, 0.2. Um, do we really, didn't really want to take that much off, so I'm gonna, going to err uh, on the side of the base only. So. So we're really concentrating on the base side, so it's from uh, 606 down to 5.8. So the <coughs> focus is on the base side. So I'm going to hold it down there, and I'm going to press it down on the base side, and just run it across. And that's all I'm really doing. What did I say? 5.86, slowly coming down. Now, of course, the other thing I'm watching out for is I want to make sure that we stay perpendicular to the bottom <coughs> of the saddle so it sits nicely in the slot. That's looking good. 5.78, that's about on the mark really, and we're at uh, 4.3, um, probably taking a little bit of cleaning up, incorporating the treble end of things now a little bit, good. So this is this is a, a challenging thing. Now you've got to remember, I'm taking this off the saddle, so this tiny amount of reduction on the saddle won't turn into exactly the same amount at the last fret. <coughs> I'd need to take more off, but I've given myself leeway to begin with. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm now going to stick this nut on, and what I'm going to aim to do is put a little bit of glue on the front edge not on the base part because I want the end of the fretboard is much more solid and much more tolerant of being um, God, <laughs> clumsy. It's much more tolerant of being not knocked off when necessary. So I just want a tiny bit of glue on these edge on the front edge here to hold it in place. But and if it does if it does need knocking off in due course then it'll come off that way and it will come away from the um, the front edge very neatly so that's in place there as tightly as I can fit it um, and put the saddle back in And we do, I'm just going to attempt to slack these off a little bit more. We don't want to uh, push the piezo saddle if we can help it. Better if you can just slip, slot in, which it can. It's another one of those nut slots that is actually slanted, which is quite a strange thing. I wonder what, I'm trying to remember what the other guitar was where it was slanted. I think it must have been uh, the Faith, which is interesting. I've not really seen that much before. 
Okay. So this will be, if you like, the first reduction on the saddle to just get a feel of how it is and whether it should go any further. Um, and what I'm also doing here is pressing the nut down so it can stick in position. Okay, so we're a tiny fraction lower, I suppose I ought to um, Uh, you know what? This isn't this isn't sitting quite in the right place. So lucky I didn't put that much um, glue on there. Should tap off very ne neatly. This is sticking out a fraction too much. <laughs> Thank you. Just going to clean that up. So the difficulty is I thought that had sat right inside this little shelf, but it appears not to be quite as clean as I thought it was. And first of all, I'm going to take whatever hanging around on here off, so a bit of leftover glue, some from previous fitting, some from what I just did. But <laughs> and um, just, a, just feeling the surface across there. Mm. Anyway, so going back to the, um, the guys I saw their videos, I just, I don't know, I was just left really hoping that he um, finds some peace and happiness, uh, you know, and, and the kind of means to go on, because it seems to have Poor fella, lost everything in a very short order. I know, we, I suppose everyone has to find a reason to carry on when those sorts of things happen, but I'm, you know, I've been through breakups and relationships and <laughs> I know how that feels and stuff, but I've never had something quite as extreme as he had, um, which is pretty, pretty tragic. So I look what's going on here. Okay, so I'm going to thin this down. There's a little edge that's interfering because it's this is overhanging. So I'm going to attempt to thin the nut a little bit more so that it sits comfortably inside the shelf area and doesn't risk the footprint overrunning onto the um, uh, finish at the back. So I'm going to just so I'm just gonna thin it down a little bit and then square it off or make sure it's squared off. <sighs> because it, I don't want it wobbling on that place. You know what I'm seeing? This isn't exactly perpendicular. Gosh darn it. <laughs> I have to accommodate for it, which isn't ideal. I'm taking away a bit more material, which I didn't want to do. But the uh, the slot isn't exactly right angled, which is uh, something of a pain in the you know where. I don't want to be uh, chiseling it or anything like that. I just want it to stand on there, please. OK, 
Come on, you can do it. Is it still sitting a tiny bit inside that line? Sorry about this. Uh, so it's not a very well cut slot. That's part of the problem. And it's uh, what's happening is it's still it's taking a while to get it down to the right size. So I'm going to take a little bit off the back now as a straight line. Cut inside a little bit. Get in there and fit on there. See, we've got something slightly uneven here, which is not good at all. Um, plastic nut took a tiny bit of material, but hardly anything came up off there. So, that's not really great. And the nut here is perfectly square, that's fine. Um, hmm. Just take a bit more flat on the back here. Okay, that's a bit better. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit more on the end here. Yeah. Anyway, yes, so the weirdest of sort of weird things that YouTube does when you you get kind of pulled in, you know, you get drawn into something um, in a good way, you know, it's, that's what that's what the that's what YouTube can do so well. You know, you can you can bring people into your world. Um, funny when when I started doing this, I had I'd, I'd done loads of um, podcasting before, loads of, some podcasting before. So I was kind of, I had some experience of um, putting stuff out, I guess, and um, albeit audio. And I also had the experience of the effect it has so that people, you get to end up meeting people who who talk to you feel they know you because they've listened to you do something talk about something and that's really that's really powerful and I, I really like that aspect of it um, uh, so I, I sort of experienced that before um, so the, the video aspect of that is sort of just a progression really I suppose I'm just giving this a sort of a press to stick it in the right direction. Okay, so I'm now going to make sure I'm happy with the string heights because all of that will have cost me a little bit of height thanks to the needing to clean the slot slightly out and uh, so on. So I'm just going to Bring these up to tension a little bit, equally. Uh, no, I'm not in the wrong way. Full. Okay, looking good. gonna leave it like that because it's it's fitted and it's working but it, it you know what that isn't the best cut not the best cut angle in the entire universe I have to say but it it's working and it's in the right place which is what matters more than anything else at this point in time um,
Okay, just going to check the time. Uh, okay, that's my wife saying, I don't really feel like shopping, so I don't have to rush back for the shopping, bless her. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use, I'm going to use just the, this one here, the U, U channel, uh, the Stumac U channel truss rod. And I'm going to start by calibrating the um, rod onto this neck, remembering it's very flat, so we, I would expect this to kind of almost need to be slacked off completely. Um, no, not quite flat. Um, yeah, so I'm going to get this to the right shape and then I'm going to very, very carefully level the frets. Um, and that will then lost my fingernails. That will then um, hopefully clear up the fret wear down here, but at the same time, hopefully, um, I'll be taking care of the uh, more over this side, the fret slap. So, as always, this tool tells me very quickly what's going on in respect of the, the frets. And actually, a quick investigation is showing me they look reasonably good. They're all cutting up. There's a flat, so a low section up here right at the end, which I don't think will be a problem because I think they'll be below our playing height. So I'm kind of concentrating on getting the fret wear out at this end and just making sure at this point all the individual notes play well. Now, if the, in, in a, any guitar, if the last few frets are low, then you don't really have a problem because they're going to be out of harm's way. It's, it's, it's quite often you'll get a low patch uh, um, in the middle of the neck, which can cause you problems. So I'm now going to run on the B track. I'm going to use the same calibration for a minute, and then I'll calibrate again for the G. Now, I can see down here I've got a little bit of fret wear and I'm going to just gently lean a little bit on this because I want that fret wear fret grooves gone if I can get them out. Now I'm not going to sort of hammer away at this forever just to remove um, a tiny bit of cosmetic fret wear but you know we're in it to level the frets and clear up a little bit if we can do that. So let's try this. Good. Right, recalibrate for the G. So this is going to be hopefully nice and quick. Maybe a little bit more down at the end here as I try and clear up that, um, what I call the, the fret slap, which is basically where the, um, the frets haven't quite got enough room to move or to spin around without running into the, um, without running into the underlying frets. And it's a, such a tiny amount that causes that. Um, and I've been discovering over years that it's, it's actually caused by just slight wibbles in the, uh, as you might call it, in the, in the shape of the neck, which you can't see with the naked eye. But this truss rod leveling beam method does seem to show up pretty well, or reveals to us quite well. So I'm um, just... Uh, where we're going. That's all looking good actually. It's kind of cutting in the same pattern as everything else. It's mostly cutting. Um, we've got rid of the wear at the beginning here and we've got lower, a little crop of lower frets there. Wow, that was just out of interest. Let me see what the playing action right now is. Okay, that's, you know, that's sitting on the two mark, we took the point two off, and that's about 1.4, 1 1.3, so it's just a little under as well. Um, I think, I'm kind of nervous, I don't want to take any more off there. I, I think this is, I think from the beginning we'd be struggling to make an appreciable difference to the action at that end. Um, 
we could do because I'm doing this leveling we could take a fraction more off but the amount we'll get off I have to say will be tiny um, it, it won't be much at all so I'm nervous about doing that I think <coughs> maybe you know I mean realistically it's a neck on a guitar you could make it the lowest you could get it to realistically would be to the action of a, an electric guitar which is 1.5 and 1.2 so you know we've got half a millimeter at most to play with um, now I'm doing the D track now and I'm at this point I really do want to hear improvement on what I called fret slap now it's interesting the low frets here are now showing up on the on the bar on the cutting so and they're only low at the treble side, so it's interesting. Clear. So hear this. Right. Gone on the D. So that little sort of what I call fret slap on several notes, a whole set of notes going up the the A track, what you're going to hear in a minute is the miracle as this method he alleviates it and makes it much better if not goes away altogether. So at this point for fret slap I, I really want the rod to do its thing it, it, you know mainly with gravity I don't really want to press much at all. I would rather do lots of repetitions until it's imposed its curve onto the fingerboard, or I'm sorry, onto the fretboard I should say, um, rather than push it in any one spot. Sometimes it does make sense to push it at a particular spot, but um, nearly. improved it. You hear that? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now go back and do a tiny bit more where I hear it still fret slapping. Now I'm being incredibly finicky here. This this is hardly noticeable but I'm now going to just concentrate my efforts a little bit more right here in this patch here um, and that's probably all I need to do with it. So this is one of those things that you can only get the feel for over time but when you do it's an amazingly elegant method. Look at that. Tiny bit there. Fret number 10, right? Tiny bit of fret 10. Watch this. Hardly any m material being removed. Fret 10. Where are we out there? So I'm just kind of pressing down a little bit around the 10 and the 12th fret, and that's it what I'm going to do. I'm using 400 grit on the beam, which um, is very light really. I haven't struggled to make it do it. Okay, let's be 12, 13, 14, 15. 15 on the 16th. I mean, I'm being really finicky now, just to prove the point. 15 and 16, okay, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, watch now, we're just going to concentrate a tiny bit right there. That's that. <laughs> I just don't believe it. It's great to hear it do it. and 12 only nothing major going on so but you know to, to to hear that other fret slap in those D and A particularly get cleared up like that it's just brilliant so a little bit of work here and we should be good to go
very pleased with that. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these strings off because we're done. I'm going to do it from both sides as if it was an adjustable nut, just you know, not to stress it in case it hasn't fully set. Um, we'll take these off and throw them away. Yeah, that's the, the, the danger, Steve, of leaving these um, sticky out bits is that they're so likely to go round and end up either spiking me, <laughs> which isn't the end of the world, but worse for you is that they end up spiking the... Uh, and this is now this is now tied on itself. There's a loop here that's now gonna <laughs> going to upset me considerably. As you know, I don't like this business. I'm going to have to try and unhook things and then the, the real danger is this is now going to it's now going to get stuck and I'm going to have to pull it out with spiky things which run a very real risk of, of damaging the headstock which is not what we want. So, so please guitarists honestly don't don't put those knots in your see no even just even though I'm, I'm I may be getting away with out injuring myself I speak too soon but even having to wrestle with those little curly bits now with things sticking out that's where you're going to get damage on the headstock and it's such a pity it, it doesn't honestly it doesn't it won't add to your tuning stability the tuning stability is entirely down to stretching out the slack in your strings and getting the nut slots right. And we've got the nut slots right. We've got the factory condition slots now in your nut at the right height. That's going to play beautifully. Um, don't want to do any special tying games at the other end. Okay, now I'm going to just gently lever up these um, pegs. Just get them moving. And what I will do is I'm going to take a tiny fraction more off the saddle. Uh, just a fraction, only because I know Steve has kind of challenged me a little bit to make a, a visible difference for him. So, you know, I've, I know what it's like that he sent it to me. Um, so I'll, I'll take it to the max. And of course, he can always increase the saddle or put a shim under there if, it, if he wants it higher again. I don't see him kind of going down that road, but... Um, now I'm going to do that off camera because I need to get a drink. Um, what I'll do next as well is I will mask up the fingerboard and then polish out all the frets um, or recrown them, sorry, and then polish them out. So the recrowning thing I can do now. Let me just put some black marker back on. Um, I can still see a tiny groove in that one, but I didn't want to go any further. I think the sanding process will get rid of it. Um, you have to sort of know when to fold, if you like, not push too hard to get rid of grooves that aren't anything but mainly cosmetic. It's a, it's not not a good idea to go hammering away at fret metal if, just because you don't like the look of them. But if you're doing leveling anyway, then you can you can kind of incorporate it all in the same uh, action. So you get, it comes as a bonus, really. So these are these are looking good. There's not an awful lot to do to recrown them because there's not a lot gone from them. Um, we're getting down to a, a thin black line down the middle of the fret very quickly. Um, might be one or two. Take a little bit longer, but actually, perhaps that one's the longest one so far. But that's good. Yeah, so I'll uh, mask it all off uh, and then uh, polish the frets, sand and polish the frets out and we'll come back when it's time to restring. So, you know, this is a an ultra low acoustic guitar action because my customer asked me for that. He sent me the guitar as he's been playing it. He knows how low it is and he wants it a little bit lighter even than that so 
if you you know if you if you have a view on that, you know I it may be that you you are a fan of of higher actions and you you've got you know strong fingers and you don't have any health issues whoops <laughs> any health issues and it's all perfect for you the way you've got it set up and that's that's absolutely fine. I'm not telling you you have to have it this way, but but before you comment on this, please remember that. The customer who has contacted me and sent me their guitar knows what they want, um, even if you don't like the sound of it. Uh, they know what they want, and they're entitled to ask for it. So I know within reason what the limits are of what I can do, um, and I can absolutely make this acoustic guitar play with an almost electric guitar height action. and. I guarantee you Steve will be able to hit big handfuls of chords and it will play beautifully. So, you know, remember if you watch my... Oh, that's my onto the, onto the uh, finish. It, remember my last video. If you have a... If you come across something, try if you come across something that you don't understand or just looks really odd to you. Instead of... Instead of jumping to, at the first opportunity to tell the world how right you are and how wrong I am, um, you know, try to try to shift from contempt to curiosity. It's a really important thing we all need to do more of. Um, I might sign off with that on every video from now on because I just I don't think there's any more time left to piss about and not say it. Uh, actually. You know, I always kind of think, oh, it's a guitar video, or, you know, nobody wants to hear your philosophy. And Well, no, you know, but you're watching me blether on for hours on end doing a, a setup. So, kind of, I can't, there's only so much I can talk about guitars in all of that time, or only so much I'd even want to. Anyway, but I think, I think it's really, I think it's a massively important thing. And actually, what, what I know from personal experience is if you, if you took this conceptual toy, this idea of this clean language thing where you, you strip out your interpretation from the way you, the things you say in communication, and instead, for example, when you think you're right and someone's wrong, um, someone else is wrong, um, use that as a prompt to yourself to ask questions instead of relying on what you think you know already. Um, you know, the, the results are incredible, really. You, you will get results you, you wouldn't imagine possible. Okay, so I'm going to... Um, what am I going to do? Do I trust the finish on this? Well, I kind of do, and I also don't have to, because I'm just going to... I'm just going to sort of fold it a little bit so it's not gripping too much. Yeah, contempt to curiosity. It's a really interesting principle. But yeah, in the simplest terms, it means when you when you think, oh, I, I wouldn't do that. I, I've had loads of people say things like that, you know. Um, that's ridiculous, making an acoustic guitar action that low. Nobody can play that, or nobody wants it. You know, there's great big statements. What they mean is, I don't want that, so I'm going to decide that nobody else does. And that's such ignorance. It's, it's such a divisive ignorant, ignorance, actually. You know, it only serves to keep people, keep people apart from each other, because we're fighting over things instead of discussing them and learning. So if you, you know, if you don't think I'm doing the right thing, ask me more about. I mean, actually, no. You can tell me you don't think I'm doing. It. The, the right thing, but but keep it really clean and say, um, d don't tell me I'm wrong, but tell me what what works for you. And you know the truth is, oh, I I don't do it like that. Okay, um, and and I don't do it like that because I've always thought that this or that. What do you think? You know, d what do you think, Sam? Is you know is that kind of does that have anything to do with why you do it this way or? Uh, did you ever do it a different way, or how have you arrived at um, the idea that this is the best way for you? Yeah, if we if we have the courage to ask a question from curiosity instead of pronouncing from contempt, 
honestly, we will change. We would change the world in our own lifetimes. But it's very, very. We're very addicted to um, the other way, you know, the contempt way, because I think it is this uh, idea that the ego is often, for many of us, not in all cultures, maybe, and certainly not in the animal kingdom, but it's certainly in the human world, we seem to be, we seem to be grow, we grow up almost chemically addicted to um, the ego needing to be, our ego needing to be right or to win at someone else's expense. So we can't just be right for us. You know, this method works for me and I'm happy with it. We have to then pronounce somebody else wrong. And that's the win-lose thing. That's a, that's a very, I mean, in some ways you could say it's an animal way, but actually animals don't even go that far. You know, I mean, I suppose they do in terms of who gets eaten and who gets the food and who starves. They do go that far. I mean, let's be frank about it, but they also surprisingly don't go that far when it comes to conflict. They don't seek out conflict. And they often, when they have conflict in their species, they don't go to the extremes that we do and kill each other. But anyway, but yeah, I recommend you move from contempt to curiosity and try communicating what by take uh, while taking out your interpretation, i.e., your judgment about what something means from it, um, it's very very hard to do to own your to own the meaning part of it. You know, so we we seem to think we know what somebody means when they tell us something that upsets us, and we make we make them responsible for the fact that we are upset. And unfortunately, I hate to say this, and this is maybe too heavy for YouTube, but the whole world of the culture at the moment where we have all these things that can and, can and cannot be said, you know, like, for example, N words and P words and X words and F words or whatever, you know, we have all these words that everybody knows, everybody hears them in their, everybody who's ever heard them knows them, hears them in their head when they say those things. But... We, we, instead of, when, you know, you look at the whole of culture's response to that, is we seem to culturally give those words power, and, and everybody argues, they've got power, of course, you, don't you understand context, and, you know, everybody, everybody, and, and I'm not saying that, of course, words have impacts and consequences and so on and so forth, but if you look at most of the debate on it, look carefully and you'll see that, in the mechanics of it is that if I use a bad word, right, the word has the power and I do it to you, right? Nowhere in that equation does anyone ever say um, you, you own the, the, the meaning or the reaction to it, that it's yours, right? I can, I can try and trigger you and I may succeed or, you know, and that's a, that's a, a pretty unsociable, uh, unkind thing to do if I if I know you're sensitive to it and it will upset you and so on that's without doubt an unkind and not very not very good thing for human togetherness and peace and harmony but I think all the focus on because what happens is when you when you give the word this imbue the word with this power and 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 mask or obscure the fact that it's each one of us that gives it the power then what happens is you focus on banning the words because they are you know you it's a bit like giving objects like drugs the power to make you happy or money the power to make you content and not worried and so on we externalize give it we give away the power of those words to the to the word itself and by definition to the person throwing it in your direction and if you notice that almost none of the energy in our current society goes into um, training kids, for example, to take back power so that no matter what words, F, Z, N, B, F, P, whatever, no matter what words somebody uses at a child, wouldn't it be fantastic if that child says, I'm in charge of my reaction to this and you, the word itself has no power. You can carry on shouting. It shows your uh, 
person who wants to create conflict that's a bit sad and I don't want to spend time with you and you know I'm going to move away from you or whatever um, but I would so much rather see our kids stripping oh no, not sorry. I'd rather see them taking responsibility ownership and responsibility for their reactions the, what they make something mean when they hear it so you know somebody says something um, you know and I take it on board that it means something it, in, in and of itself it doesn't mean anything it doesn't have to mean anything so we make it mean something and either I make it mean something when I hear it and I choose to feel a, a way about it or if, if that isn't the story you want to believe in then somebody else has the power and they make you feel something and that's a for me, that's a scary proposition that we live by. Well, I see what it creates. It creates people who can't have no choice but to get into a fight. Somebody says something about your mother, you must then fight them. You know, that's it. Uh, which is a real shame. Okay. Yeah, so it, I found that I just wish they would do more of that. I wish they would teach our kids, teach kids more, that we have, we give words individually. I, the recipient, give these words their meaning and their power over me. Or I don't have to. There is, you know, there is nothing. You know, this 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 automatic hardwired connection where we argue so strongly I mean and if I said this to anybody you know any of you listening to this now could probably get you know I'm sure it's triggered somebody and they're gonna go no you have no understanding you've got no empathy I'm not I'm unempathetic about anything I'm just saying that um, we don't have to there's no automatic law that says I have to feel anything when you call me fat or ugly or stupid, or a crap guitar player, or well, all the trigger things that that I, you know, I can I can be sensitive to, right? But what do I do? Do I do I create a world in which nobody can ever, you know, I control people's mouths so tightly, and I have a legislation for putting people in jail if they call me fat or ugly or bald or whatever, you know? Do I do I make a world? That, that is where I, where I, where I outlaw the, 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 you know, the, the process of anybody offending me? Or do I have a happier and much more powerful engaged life by taking back my reaction to it? I know which the answer is for me, without a doubt. Anyway, heavy duty stuff, but it's all part of the... It's all part of the... Um, those it's all part of awareness and and taking back control of you know who makes things mean anything so i i've said for a long time you can't insult me there's nothing you can say that will insult me if i choose to feel bad about something you point out to me then that's my that's my business to deal with but you can't insult me. I don't have a concept of, you've insulted me, you've insulted my mother, I must, you've insulted my sister, I must, you know, strike you and fight you and destroy you. I felt the urges to do that, but I recognize that it's, it's my sad ego kicking in, my frightened little ego kicking in. And I've given your words the power to create, for me to create a load of bad chemistry and self-doubt and loathing, self-loathing. And I took your words and I did that to myself. What a stupid thing to do. I mean, what a tragic thing to do. And stupid in, in many ways. So I don't give that power. Don't give people the power to do that. You, you know, and I, I, I get tested on that. You know, somebody says something on YouTube and part of me, you know, I feel the, the urge to lash out like the like the animal cornered, you know, my, my lizard brain kicks in. And then I r realize that what somebody says has no power. 
I don't give it power. And if, if, I'm, if I'm aware of that and I am consistent about that, then guess what? That becomes true. People don't have the power to make me feel anything. You know, bad. Um, and it's an amazing realization because I don't have to get dragged into reacting to stuff. I'm not always perfect. Sometimes when I'm a bit unconscious, um, I will let myself get dragged in because it's like the easy way, the old way. I can, I can be all victimy and oh, you hurt my feelings, and but it isn't, it isn't the case. Nobody hurts my feelings except me. Da -da. Right on that bombshell, I'm going to go and polish out these here frets and come back when it's time to restring, which hopefully I guess will be in this next short period of time, half an hour or so. See you shortly. Okay, the frets polished and board ironed, you know what I mean, ironing boarded. Um, so now we uh, will push out to zoom out. No, that's zoom in, baby. Zoom out. Apply Put this on here, where it might stay still, where it might not. Oh, come along now. Sorry, sorry. View, now will do. View, that'll do. Okay, so now I'm going to put the new strings on. Same gauge as before, 1152s. And same applies as the last electric guitar. They need some stretching done to them. Um, uh, but we want to get them st strung up in a nice, simple fashion that doesn't cause, uh, result in bits of string sticking out, cutting into other people's fingers or, or your headstock finish. So also we want to pull up the barrels, barrels, the ball ends of the string, so they're right underneath the... Um, or sitting right underneath the pegs. I've just been listening while I was doing the frets, just listening to, I don't know if you've ever heard, Dan Carlin, um, C-A-R-L-I-N, is this guy who does this fantastic history channel. Uh, I think it started out as podcasts, audio podcasts, and then he's also turned them into audio books, but he's also putting the same, some of the same stuff out on just four or five hour long, two, three, four hour long YouTube videos, which are just audio. Um, but I was just listening to one of those and they're absolutely fantastic. Brilliant history. I mean, gripping history. If, you, if you've never listened to Dan Carlin, go and find his stuff and just pick one of his four or five hour ones and have a, have a listen. He's an amazing storyteller of history. Okay, so I'm putting that quite close up for this, just to show the string fitment that I recommend for electric guitars as well as uh, acoustics like this. So again, get all your posts lined up. Just makes things easier to do. And then put the string through, pull it full through, taut, hold it at the first fret and then pull back a fret and then start winding and hold it then as it winds and direct the held string above the loose string and as the loose string comes round push the held string down and pull the loose string up and then you get a sort of crimp that locks it off perfectly and before it goes too far round and gets inaccessible cut the thing right back as tight as possible there's your first one <sighs> same again oh, I think what I'll do by the way before I finish that I'll put the truss rod cover back on because I'm okay with how the rod is I'm not didn't really see a need to adjust it since it's flat but it's playing seems to be playing fine um, you need a little bit of curvature oh, I say it's flat it's got some curvature but it's it's relatively flat and that has a sort of an Im overall impact on the way the guitar feels which 
kind of kept because that's the way it came to me. Pull back one, wind it on, hold it tight, direct it over the loose one and then under the loose one. <coughs> And then as it comes round, snip it. And so on and so forth. Okay, well this this is a sort of full as full a setup as I would ever normally do on an acoustic guitar. It's only I've only done a couple recently where I've done fret leveling, but they were specific requests. Um, for lower actions and cleaning up fret wear, so that's why. Um, but typically you can make big improvements on an acoustic guitar right down to about a 2mm down to 1.5 on the high E type of action without strictly needing to level the frets, unless you're getting some fret slap as I was getting there and that you saw how the leveling process was a way of alleviating the fret slap which is a pretty amazing thing to be able to hear it and it with your own eyes as it happens. It's very uh, encouraging from the point of view of the tech because I I know what's working and what isn't. I don't have to sort of wait and take potluck. I, I can tell whether the process is bearing fruit and if it isn't I also then get to stop and reconsider you know figure out why it's not working um, because there must be something else that I'm not taking into account. It's rare that happens but occasionally you, you know you have to be aware of that and be prepared to stop and reconsider if it isn't working the way you expect it to. And the, the reason for stopping and reconsidering is so that you you stop before you take too much fret metal away for no good reason. Because actually if you get to a point where you find you realize that it it isn't leveling that's needed, there's something else going wrong, then you've you've taken away, chased away a fair bit of fret metal for no good reason. So we've tried to avoid that at all costs. Okay. So with this, the intonation is preset in the saddle. Um, it's compensated saddle, so the pattern of intonation is, is pre-arranged and there's nothing you can do about it. So if somebody says they're going to charge you money for intonating your acoustic guitar, intonating the strings. Ask them exactly how they plan to do that, because unless they are moving your bridge or building you a complete new saddle with, with the... Uh, um, zoom you out, sorry about this. Um, yeah, complete new saddle with uh, the pivot point or the top point of the saddle being somewhere completely different unless they're doing that then they're not they've got no power over the intonation it's given in the staggered pattern on the um, bridge and that's why it's called pre-compensated or a compensated saddle so you see there forward the uh, apex point is right at the front there remember the whole saddle is slanting backwards anyway so by default the uh, bass string gets a longer string and the treble one the high E gets a shorter one but within that there are some variations even then so there's the start point the B gets set back off that one the G jumps forward again and then the D A and E uh, bend backwards or they head backwards to the back of this saddle so it's a very particular thing and and it's fixed because you can't do anything else there's no other adjustment you can make um, I, there are very few acoustic guitars that I've ever seen, I don't think, that have individually adjustable intonation. Uh, it's just not something. You'd have to have something like a tunematic bridge built in. I have never seen that. Right, let's start with our a
fine. That is as low as you're going to get with an acoustic guitar. I promise you that much. Okay, so that's that part done. The only thing that remains now is to stretch out the strings that we've put on them and uh, Yep. So thumb and forefinger stretching, Whoop. stretching on the other side of the nut if you can. Wherever there's a bit of string, try and stretch it a little bit. And you'll hear that it puts the guitar out of tune. Um, and however much it goes out of tune, it relates to however much slack there was stored up in there ready to go out of tune. So what we're doing is we're forcing it out of the system, basically, so that it doesn't come back or it doesn't eke its way out when we're playing the guitar. So get it done now is my recommendation. So, a bit more stretching. Right, so that's about it for tonight. Two, ga two guitars, guitars done today. Oh, and some spraying. I've got to bring in the spray job that I just did. Clear spray on JT's Candy Apple Red Stratocaster body to go with his strange, very non-standard hockey stick neck. And I call it a strap body. It's, a, it's not a strap, but well, it's a strap shape, but it's being set up for 24 fret neck. Oh, that's interesting, that little ping. That's it. I'm going to keep an eye on that when I try it out tomorrow, see if the ping is coming from anywhere. It might be, it looks like it might have crept forward a bit from here. It might be just tightening up and pulling the ball up from the pegs. I don't think it's going through here because tusk nuts, in my experience, are always pretty well cut to accommodate all string sizes and these are by no means large. They're 11s to 52, so it's the smaller end of the acoustic um, game. Um, so we shall we shall see if uh, we'll see what happens and we'll make an adjustment if necessary. There you go, the Epiphone EJ two hundred uh, EJ yeah EJ two hundred lovely big sounding guitar now with tusk nut and um, new strings and a slightly lowered action very slightly lowered. Thanks for watching. See you very soon.